Okay, welcome to this session uh, called Is Democracy Worth Defending? Uh, the obvious answer to that question is no, and uh, so thanks for coming. And uh, <laughs> No, uh, yeah, we've got two great speakers here today. Um, Andrew Murray, who is Chief of Staff of Unite Unison, uh, the Deputy President of Stop the War. Uh, and we've got uh, Danielle Bono, who is from the Front de Gauche, <laughs> uh, is the correct pronunciation, uh, the left front uh, in France. She's a political activist on the French left. Uh, I'm going to let the sp speakers speak for about 15 minutes each and then open up for discussion, so questions and contributions. Uh, first, just before I let Andrew start, I'm going to just make an announcement about the lunches. If you haven't had anything to eat, there's some delicious packed lunches at the back for four pounds. I strongly recommend the falafel. Uh, but without further ado, I'll let Andrew start. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Naz. If I could just slightly correct your um, introduction of me, it's Unite the Union, not Unite the Unison. That would be, <laughs> that would be a merger too far for me. <laughs> uh, <so> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, thanks for the invite to speak today. And thanks. Although, although the question, as the chair implies, does have a sort of obvious answer, it's still uh, an important question, I think, to discuss and debate for several uh, reasons. Uh, the first should be that it's, it's a question that arises today in large part because of the economic crisis that's gripping all of Europe uh, and this country. Uh, because there's a lot of comparisons now with uh, the crash of 1929, the situation in the 1930s. But we have to remember that the economic crisis of the 30s, the unemployment and the misery uh, and the poverty, was only the third worst aspect of the 1930s. The second worst was that it led to a wholesale attack on democracy, I mean, most dramatically and luridly and disastrously in Nazi Germany, but otherwise more or less everywhere across Europe and beyond. Now, history doesn't repeat itself in a sort of mechanical way, and I don't think anyone uh, is expecting Hitler-type figures to storm to power uh, anywhere in Europe imminently. However, the underlying fact that in a capitalist system, democracy, for the point of view of the elite and the establishment, is really democracy for the good times. It's democracy when uh, any consequence that might come of the rights that democracy bestows aren't going to fundamentally challenge the underlying premises of the system. And that doesn't work when you hit a slump. It doesn't hit work when you have uh, a crisis that shows every sign of dragging on and on, imposes heavy burdens on those least able to bear it, and undermines the entire stability of the system. And that's what we're seeing in different countries across Europe today already. It's not like the 1930s in the sense of uh, open fascist coups or marches on Rome, uh, but it is still the dismantling of a democracy in favor of the interests of the elite. And we can see that in Greece, uh, and in Italy, where elected governments, and uh, I don't suppose anyone here is really going to hold a candle for Berlusconi, but nevertheless, he was the product of an electoral uh, process uh, into a lot of corruption and uh, uh, all the rest of it, but he still was, and he has been dismissed, and the Greek government uh, of Papandreou likewise sacked and have been replaced by uh, appointees of Brussels, or in fact, advisors to Goldman Sachs uh, in both cases. Uh, a, a sort of a, a bizarre irony uh, that a bank more identified with the world economic crisis than any other single institution uh, now has its people running to major European countries. But there's two things that are significant beyond that obvious statement of a sort of banker's takeover regarding Italy and Greece, which is that firstly, this wasn't a coup against the elected politicians because it was enabled by the elected politicians, both elected politicians of the right uh, and the, uh, the left, the social democratic left as well, who gladly voted away uh, the um, political authority, handed it over 
uh, to these uh, governments of uh, technocrats, which is a misleading term. The technocrats in Greece uh, include uh, neo-fascists uh, established in the cabinet as a result of this maneuver. And they said, we will give you our authority, we'll give you uh, our power, and we'll take a step back so you can deal with the crisis, you can impose the economic measures which could be fatal to any democratic politician, and then you can give us back the power when it makes no difference. Uh, in a way, I mean, th there's no perfect historical parallels, but it's more like uh, the, the fact that the Vichy regime in 1940s in France was established by a vote of the remnants of the Third Republic's parliament, handing over power uh, to a dictator uh, because uh, the democratically elected uh, had lost the will uh, to fight. So, firstly, we see the, the politicians themselves as being incapable defenders of democracy. And that's the first thing we need to understand if we're talking about the need to defend democracy. It can't be left to the politicians who are democratically elected and are presumably the sort of prow of the ship of democracy to actually defend it for themselves because they would rather, at times of crisis, rather than uh, fight for the people, they'd rather hand over to technocrats, unelected forces of one sort or another to do the dirty work for them. But the second thing, and perhaps even more alarming, is that certainly in Italy, there's been no great popular upsurge to defend our democratically elected politicians. Uh, in Greece, the situation is somewhat different, but all the polling evidence shows that the two hitherto major parties uh, are looking at a potentially disastrous result in the forthcoming Greek general election. Whereas in Italy, a general election isn't scheduled, I believe, until next year. And most people have shown uh, so far, an indifference to this sort of uh, takeover by the bankers' representatives. And that isn't surprising because you can see that uh, they can, anyone can understand that these politicians uh, have failed. They failed to stand up uh, to uh, the bankers' demands. They failed right politicians and left politicians as well in too many countries to actually articulate uh, the people's uh, interests. And they have, in a, in a manner, uh, disgrace themselves. So actually not only is it the case that the democratically elected politicians can't be trusted to defend democracy, by their conduct and by their record, uh, they have itself often uh, undermined it uh, by betraying the trust of the people who voted for them. Now we might say, well in Britain there's no, uh, there's no likelihood of uh, technocrats uh, taking over or whatever, but of course that's because from the point of view of high finance, which is probably more powerful in Britain than any other single major country in the world, virtually, uh, they already have their people in office, their people are uh, in power, uh, and I think we'll see that uh, dramatically in the forthcoming budget, which looks like it's shaping up to be uh, a brazenly class attack that's going to cut taxes for the rich while cutting pay for some of the poorest workers uh, in the public services. So there's no need, uh, as it were, to have for uh, those worried about the crisis to execute an anti-democratic, anti-parliamentary manoeuvre in Britain because it all looks safe for them. But I think that, again, is misleading uh, as well because democracy is a power system and those it has placed in power uh, in Britain are, I think, on the brink of just as much discredit as they are in other countries uh, across Europe. In fact, we have uh, an elite uh, an establishment, a ruling class, which has disgraced itself multiply over the last 10 years in ways in which people uh, fully understand and can see through. They took us a uh, bipartisan basis uh, into a war uh, in Iraq uh, on the basis uh, of what are now universally known to be lies uh, and in the teeth uh, of the biggest movement of opposition this country uh, has ever seen. They again, on a bipartisan basis, uh, sold us a dud bill of goods in neoliberalism, told us it was no more uh, boom and bust, Well, we had a phony boom and are now living through an epic bust. We've had the uh, corruption of politicians exposed uh, in the MPs' expenses uh, scandal. And I think generally the left possibly missed uh, a trick there uh, when there was a huge popular, uh, popular anger to actually start talking about what democracy really means, alternative uh, 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 concepts of uh, democracy uh, at a time when there was a tidal wave of disgust uh, at the behaviour of uh, elected parliamentarians, or many of them at any event, uh, sweeping the country. 
So we in Britain uh, have a discredited uh, elite. Uh, I mean, so often you actually get a sort of the opportunity to actually have almost a picture of what it looks like. But we now actually have that picture, at least in our mind's eyes, if not in reality. Although I don't believe no one took a picture of David Cameron on top of uh, Rebecca, Hooks, uh, Rebecca Brooks's Metropolitan Police loaned horse uh, at the time. I'm sure that picture is out there somewhere, but it does sort of sum up uh, the corruption of the, uh, the banker's politician riding the policeman's horse loaned to Rupert Murdoch's uh, hack, uh, as it were. And, uh, and, and, and that sort of sums up the state of the elite. Of course, if you want to sort of carry it forward to its conclusion, the horse is now dead, uh, which... <laughs> well, you've got to feel sorry for the horse, because actually it's bad enough being a, a metropolitan police horse, being forced to charge at demonstrations, ferry less intelligent species around the capital for years. The least you deserve is dignity in retirement. And, uh, but, this, th but this sums up the state of our uh, elite uh, today. Uh, and that in it is in itself uh, a danger to democracy. Uh, if you have a political elite that is completely discredited and is hanging on to power for its own interests as a part of a corrupt network of privilege. And let's not think that democracy isn't going to be challenged by that elite in more explicit and understandable forms. Because I, I have read in the last month articles in the Daily Telegraph by senior journalists, ones arguing it's time to say, if you want to vote, you have to pay at least £100 a year in tax. Well, that knocks out, of course, uh, everyone who's not uh, working uh, immediately. Another article actually looking to extend the franchise by saying it's time we gave businesses the right to vote. The, the wealth creators take the city of London as a model of good governance, where, of course, the only people that get to vote uh, are um, uh, uh, bankers uh, and businessmen. And these ideas, of course, they're on the margins now, but they're already creeping in uh, to uh, the mainstream in many ways. There are, there are um, measures going through Parliament uh, which will uh, devastate the electoral registration by driving possibly millions of the poorest people uh, off the electoral register. And we know how the government is already gerrymandering constituencies. You put all this together, there is a sustained elite attack on democracy, which is only masked by the fact it is led by people like the government who are themselves uh, democratically elected. So I think there does have to be a campaign to defend democracy, but not democracy as it is, because democracy as it is, is for millions of people either indefensible or a lack of, it certainly will not arouse any great passion to uh, defend it. And in defending democracy, we have to rely, I believe, first of all, and unashamedly, uh, on the labor movement in this country. If you list the achievements of a labor movement in this country and around the world, um, obviously, pay and conditions and lifting people out of misery uh, in, uh, uh, over generations uh, has been central, but so also has been the creation uh, and the defense of such democratic rights uh, as we enjoy. So I think the labor movement has a huge task to do, not in defending uh, the status quo. If people think the status quo de is democracy and democracy is the status quo, that's a dangerous uh, position for us. We have to use the economic crisis to develop new ideas of power, how we can move away from a strictly and very narrow representative form uh, of democracy to a democracy that actually delivers what it says on the tin, which is the power of the people. So those are my thoughts uh, on why the answer to the question uh, should uh, be yes. Uh, that democracy is worth defending, but it can't be left uh, to the elected politicians uh, to do it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, Danielle, over to you. Okay, so first, um, to begin to give elements to that question, uh, I like to question the question because when we say democracy as a whole, most people think about electoral politics, getting people elected every once in a while, every five years, every two years, and then let them govern, and that is supposed to be democracy. And if we think democracy is that system, of course, there are an easy answer to the question, because when you check on the rates of participation in, ele in election in most countries in Western Europe, there are, for instance, in France, in the past, election, it was between 30 to 60, up to 60% of abstention in election. So just people 
doesn't care about electoral politics and more and more people are just alienated from politics as it is, institutions and all. So the, the, the obvious question is they, they don't even care going to say what they want for uh, democratic government and stuff and that could be left to that. But that can't actually because to me and I think uh, what we have also to discuss is what is democracy to us? Um, it's just not institution, electoral, uh, governments. It is also about daily and concrete things in life, in daily life. It's about, to me, um, power and control of, uh, individual power and control over our lives, over our society. And what it does means, I want just to, 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 to give a, a concrete example about what is democracy. Uh, and what is worth fighting for in such democracy. I think Andrew talked about it a little bit uh, at the end about um, the basic socio socio-economic rights which were democratic gains by the labor movement, by the social movement, and which have been under attack over the past, I mean, decades uh, due to neoliberal policies. And it's about social services, it's about health care, it's about uh, mass education, and, and so on and so on. And there needs to be a fight because those, are, those were uh, the means by which people, uh, working class people, uh, gain more power over their lives collectively, more power to go to school, more power, more power to get free health care and stuff like that. And, and um, if we see democracy uh, such as those different socioeconomic rights, they need to be defended because, and even more since the big crisis in 2008 and all, there are increased attacks on those socioeconomic rights all over Europe. And we don't even need to see and, and to talk about what is happening in Greece now, which is a complete, uh, I mean, the country is going back to the 19th century when you think about all the cuts and the, the austerity measures that are, that are happening. Uh, we have been uh, living in such uh, a state of attacks in a lot of countries around Europe, in France, in, in, in England, and, and so on. But the, the danger are, are even higher now because of the crisis, and, uh, and the attacks are going to be even more harsh. So that are the democratic rights we, are, we need to, to defend. And also because it leads to, to uh, more political rights. When you see, for instance, what is happening in countries in Europe like Hungary, where there are far-right governments who are just uh, cutting not only social rights, but also democratic rights. Uh, it's, it also shows what has been said about Greece when there are technocrats who are just put at the top of the society. And it, uh, it affects our daily lives, about the right to, uh, to to do, uh, to, to do whatever we want in society or under attack also. But I think it's also what democracy is, it's just not just to defend the, the, the socio-economic rights, it's also to expand uh, what I call um, civil rights. Uh, for instance, we have, this, we have this debate now in France about, because it's a political uh, year, there's presidential elections and there's a lot of debates uh, happening um, about civil and political rights, for instance, about uh, lesbian and gay rights, the rights to get married, and the rights to have children. Uh, it's like, okay, uh, are we talking about a democracy where there are people who aren't allowed to get married and get divorced if they want to and have children just because of their sexuality? And this is undemocratic, and those rights still need to be fought for and won for for, uh, uh, for a large part of the, the population. And it's just like this, this, these fights uh, are, to be, are to be won if we want to talk about a democracy, a day-to-day -day democracy for anyone uh, living in, in, in our countries. Uh, there's also a, 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 a discussion about immigrants' rights, the rights for foreign immigrants, to get, um, to get elected and to vote in local election in France. I mean, it should be um, easy to imagine that when you live somewhere for a couple of years, you should be able to say what you want about the, the, the council and the, and, and the politics. But immigrants people, I mean, in, in France, foreign immigrants people are deprived of this basic right, which is to decide and to get somebody elected. 
uh, and to, 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 to be elected. So those are the, the kind of um, uh, fights we need to have just because not, it's not just about uh, lesbian and gay rights or immigrants' rights, because it, co it, it also affects uh, uh, everyone in the society. When you, when you uh, give the right to marry and the right to adopt children to lesbian and gay, you also change the idea of family, you, s you also change the idea of, of couple and marriage for the whole of the society. When you, talk, when you say immigrants people, can I have the right to vote? You change also the idea of what is nation state, what is nationality. So those are the kind of fights we need to have if we want to even uh, just ideologically to change the state of mind and, and say there still need to be progress. The, the, the democracy as it is, isn't enough. We don't just have to have defensive rights. We have also have to have offensive fights in order to expand the, the rails of democracy in society. And, and for that to happen, uh, the key element to me is, is uh, uh, the involvement of a large, uh, lar the, the largest part of the population in social movements, in mass movements, to get, to get those right, to, to, to resist the attack. We need social movement. What we've seen in the, in the, the past years in France have been uh, mass movement to defend healthcare, to defend pension, uh, against pension reform. And, and um, also the social movement and the lesbian and gay community and uh, the, the, the pro-immigrant movement have been really essential in, 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 in um, building the, the fight for more democratic rights. Uh, and that's, that's essential, just not just to, to win uh, those battles, but also because in the process of building those movements, people begin to change and people begin to question not only the very, uh, the, the, the first uh, demands they had, but also the society of the world. This is a, what is, is, is essential is that people stop being passive, people stop feeling useless and powerless. And because of my mass movements, that's um, when they became actors and they feel like we can change things, if we are, there are more people onto the street, if there are more people on strike, we can, we can change things. And then anything, really anything uh, can actually happen. And also, they experiment also the limits of democracy. Uh, for instance, in, in France, when we, we had millions of people in 2010 into, onto the street against pension reforms, and I mean, the majority of the population, all the opinion polls said that the majority of the population is against this pension reform. And regardless of that, the government passed the reform, the Sarkozy government passed the reform. And then just people realized that uh, the system is just crazy and it, it doesn't work when you got the majority of the people fighting for someone and the government, the one they elected, I mean, a majority of the people elected this government do the exact opposite of what, what the people, uh, what the people want and what the people say. And just like it creates, I think an important, um, uh, awareness and consciousness of the limits of the electoral system, of the mimic, of the, uh, the actual so-called democracy, and people begin to question it and say, so we should get rid of those, those people and also change the system because it can't, it can't, it can't, uh, it can't go this way. Uh, we also had an, another uh, important movement in, in France the, uh, during the past year was the 2005 campaign against the European Constitution. And, uh, and there was a mass movement. Uh, uh, what was interesting is at the beginning, uh, the, all the opinion polls say people will vote yes to the constitution, the European constitution, which, which was pro-neoliberal and, 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 and terrible. And there was a, 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 um, a local rank and file campaign by left group, by trade unions, and people began to read this uh, horrible constitution with lots of technocratic terms. And the people said, we, we can, yeah, we, we, we want to, we, we get interested in that, in that, and, 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 uh, and we finally won the no, the left no, won the, 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 the vote, and, uh, and, um, and it was a great, uh, a great educational process, and people were talking to the street about, about Brussels, and that, 
people have never been more interested in Europe, actually, uh, than during that movement. And while at the same time, the European election got the, the, the worst participation rates. So in this movement, people get, get really interested. But at the end of the day, the government decided to just uh, go for it, and they just uh, forget about what the people had said in this, in this campaign, and they just, just, just went along with the, with the Euro constitution and stuff. And it was also an, a very important uh, moment and saying like those people don't represent us because when, when uh, people are on strike, when they are on to the street, when there's a majority in the population who doesn't want pension reform, who doesn't want a, Euro a European constitution, a neoliberal European constitution, they just don't give a shit and they just go al uh, along with their, uh, with their politics, which are uh, fundamentally anti-people. So I think uh, the, the, uh, the idea that we not only need to resist, but we also go on the offensive and in that process, new uh, areas uh, of, um, of also discussion, but of ideas uh, are, um, are, are open for people to get into action and, and begin questioning the system. And it doesn't even mean to, to at first be revolutionary ideas. Most of the time, it's just basic bread and butter issue people get involved in. And uh, for instance, I'm just gonna finish on this, this slide example. Uh, there's a big fight, uh, a big working, a working class fight in France nowadays about um, workers who got their factory closed down. And at first it was a very defensive fight just not to get fired and stuff like that. But in the process, they begin to think about how the factory was run and how actually they were the one running the factory. And they begin to think about, okay, well, the boss wants to, to sell the, 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 the factory, but what if we bought it back and we owned it and we can make it make it make it uh, run by, by ourselves and they've been on to on to uh, on strike not only to uh, prevent the the firing but also to get ownership of the of the factory and just begin to organize by themselves and it's been going on for 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 several months now and it's a very important issue uh, in the in in the movement and they are still on 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 uh, uh, in, in the movement. So I think just to, to conclude, uh, those are the, the small examples of democratic rights uh, that we need to defend, democratic movement that we need to build. And I think nowadays we, we got the crisis, as Andrew said, and, and politicians being uh, uh, just useless uh, to do anything. Uh, they, they keep going with the attacks against the people. And I think that uh, this is a moment where the democracy, the, the democracy fight we need to, to, to have uh, is able to begin a true democratic one, which means a revolutionary one, when the, those on the top, as uh, I think it's Lenin who used to say that, those on, uh, the, those on the top can't rule the way they used to, which is actually what is happening with the crisis, and they, do, they don't have any be planned to, to change the system. And those on the bottom just won't be ruled uh, just like the way it was and, and feel like there, there is a overweight. They should be overweight than just like in Greece, uh, austerity after austerity and, 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 and uh, just survive. We need to do more survive. And so in those times, this is a moment where true democratic change can happen, which means revolutionary, revolutionary changes. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a kind of paradox, really, around this, uh, around this question in the society at the moment, because on, on the one hand, um, uh, people certainly are questioning um, whether or not at least a certain form of democracy is worth defending. Um, for the reasons that, that Andrew said, that the, the depth of the neoliberal uh, offensive is removing the um, democratic elements of the society is increasingly giving you a political system uh, in which there are no meaningful alternatives provided by the major parties. I think it was Noam Chomsky that uh, described the American political system as a, a totalitarian system with two different factions. Uh, but the trouble is that a lot of Western Europe is beginning to look like that, 
Greece and Italy are beginning to look like that, and this is a, a, a massive force which is eroding uh, people's uh, participation rates in elections, never mind about their faith in the outcome of, uh, of, of elections. And then there's a second element, which I think has been very important in the last 10 years, and that is that democracy has become the ideology of war. We're in Afghanistan to teach people who haven't got democracy that they should have it, and they should have it this way, and they should have it at the end of a bomb. We're in Iraq to teach people that they aren't democratic enough, and we're going to bomb them into democracy. We're talking about doing the same to Iran. So for many, many people, um, a democracy is simply a facade for uh, colonial uh, style interventions um, in other people's in other people's country, and this is having a, a, a corroding effect on the whole idea. But the paradox comes from this fact: that at the same time that this has been happening, every modern revolution of any scale has been fundamentally a democratic uh, revolution. The Arab revolutions uh, may be pregnant with more and different outcomes, but as they stand in Egypt and Tunisia in Yemen, in Bahrain, whether they've succeeded partially or are still fighting, they are about the desire for, uh, for, uh, for democracy. The same was true in the Indonesian revolution. The same was true in the fall of apartheid. The same uh, has been true in practically every modern revolution. And we have to say that when the scale of a movement over decades presents that as its immediate objective, you have to take cognizance of that. And what we have to say is, we're not defending the democracy that exists. We're fighting for a different form of democracy, for a deeper form of democracy. I think it was uh, Hilaire Belloc that said uh, about England that in England, the law in its majesty uh, allows everybody uh, to be equal. They're equally free to dine at the Ritz or sleep under Lambeth Bridge. And we all know that economic inequality, economic exploitation undermines democracy because in the second Labour election, the first person through the door of number 11 Downing Street was Rupert Murdoch. Now, he doesn't even able to vote in, in this country, Some but we all know that economic concentrations of power corrupt democracy. So what we're fighting for is certainly the defense of what democracy we have from people who are trying to take it away from us, but we're really fighting for a democracy which includes the ability to control the economic mechanism of the society as well as the political mechanism of the society because that's the only real uh, democracy that there is. And the, the historical word for that struggle is a struggle for socialism. Um, it was exactly that point that I wanted to, um, to pick up on. I think uh, when we're discussing democracy, I think there's... there's uh, two points which we have to start off with in terms of framing the debate. The first one is what is democracy and the second one is where do we stand in relation to that. In terms of democracy, I think um, there's two, well, three terms which um, sum up to me. One is accountability, the second one is representation, the third one is going beyond that into participation directly in it. Um, in terms of accountability, um, in the, um, the limited democracy that we have, um, the number of uh, elected posts, democratically elected posts that you have, which are actually subject to immediate recall um, as a principle of democracy, is is tiny if there are any at all. Um, uh, and I think that that, that really um, demonstrates quite well what um, the restrictions on the, our current democratic system are. In terms of uh, representation, if we look at the number of the, uh, all the posts in our in our current system of governing our society that have uh, defined parameters and defined roles within our society, how many of them are actually democratically elected? Um, and the answer is an infinitesimally small amount of them when you take into account the wider free market economy. And uh, nobody in this, uh, in this society votes for their managers, nobody votes for the directors. Um, and these are all things which I, uh, uh, as, as a call centre worker in Glasgow, I would very much like to elect my managers, um, <laughs> given the, the standard of the, the competency, not only in running their teams, but also uh, uh, or, or running the, the capitalist system. Like, e it's a bad idea and they can't even get that right. Um, uh, and thirdly, I think we have to go beyond um, electing other people to do our, uh, to do jobs for us. I think we need to do really talk about um, getting, uh, uh, changing, having people that, that make decisions and have political discussions over the, the contradictions and the people that actually go out and do stuff and, and uh, whether that's um, actually building stuff with their hands or, or campaigning in the streets and putting up 
posters and flyers and the kind of stuff that we do. We need people to be doing the, bo uh, the same thing. That goes as much for the economy and our, and our, our political spheres as it does for our, our campaigning work um, as leftists. Um, and I think we need to build all of, all of these threes in our work that we're doing at the moment, but we also need to campaign them for them, for them generally in our society. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just would like to remind people of the very fact that neither the Tories nor the Lib Dems actually went into the elections in 2010 announcing that they would cut public services by 40% and thus have no mandate to cut. Neither were they actually elected on a majority. And that's why we saw the student demonstration taking up the questions of democracy in such a stark way, really flagging up that the Lib Dems had gone into the fight, uh, into the elections, proclaiming for free education and suddenly we're ratcheting up tuition fees to 9,000 pounds a year. And that picture is repeating itself in Spain and it has repeated itself at the beginning of this century when the IMF came to Argentina. And one of the main slogans in Argentina was que se vayan todos, they, must all, they all must go. And in the same vein, actually what we saw in Spain with the Indignados movement and Democracia Real, ya, Real Democracy Now was they don't represent us. And that really echoes across the globe when we see the movements arising at, at, this, time, at this time. But what, what does real democracy actually look like? Because if you, if you live until 80, you might have 30 minutes of democracy at a ballot box. But what, what real democracy would look like is, telling, is actually how are things produced, what things are produced, for whose purpose are things produced, and actually the slogan from Occupy Wall Street, we are the 99% means that we need to say, we need a society running the interest of the 99%. But everything, is, all the odds are stacked against us. Because if you look what's happening in Greece and Italy, actually it resembles pretty much a Chinese democracy. No one talks about what the European Parliament is, is doing. Actually, it's the European Central Bank which takes all the decisions. But there's solutions to the problem, and we're seeing those solutions being made at this current conjuncture in Greece. Steel workers have occupied their factories for nearly four months now, and in, in Greece, a, a, work pa uh, a newspaper, the Eletheropia, has been occupied now, and they're producing a, a, a paper. We can run this society without bosses, without managers, without CEOs, and ultimately, it's the kind of workers' democracy that we need to be striving for at this period and putting a real alternative to the austerity agenda onto the, onto the table. I don't want to just repeat what everybody else has been saying, really, and that was nicely put, Mark, but do we live in a democracy? Just ask yourself, do you get a chance to vote on what time you start work? Do you get a chance to vote on how much you get paid? Do you get a chance to vote on what you produce? We don't live in a democracy. We live in a fake democracy. The question that was asked uh, for this meeting, I think, was, is democracy worth defending? Two bloody right it is. We live in a sham democracy. We only get the crumbs that the bastards have allowed us to have. But it's been bought at the price of the blood of our mothers and fathers, our grandmothers and grandfathers. And this isn't metaphorical, mythical, allegorical blood. Listen to the song, Strange Fruit. People died in the United States to be allowed to have the right to be treated as human beings. That wasn't just, oh, the bloody Americans, that's them all the time. Peterloo Massacre in this country, where the mounted militia charged a crowd of working people in the 19th century and literally sabred men, women, and babes in arms to death because they dared to ask for the right to have some say in how their lives were run. So when Andrew says there's a nasty move going on to chip away at the limit, of the limited democracy we've got at the moment, he's right. We should cling like grim death to every little scrap of democracy that we've been able to wring out of bastards, but not for one second fool ourselves that that is the end of the argument. And I'll just close on this. If I sound a little bit passionate or a little bit um, angry about this, <laughs> I'm 55. You wouldn't believe it looking at me. <laughs> I don't want my grandkids to grow up having to be grateful if they're lucky enough 
to be getting up at six o'clock in the morning to work a 10 or 11 hour shift doing shit. Because that is what we are facing if we allow those bastards that run us at the moment to carry on. So I'm absolutely with the comrades at the frontier. Democracy is worth defending, but let's make it our democracy and kick those bastards out for once. <laughs> Yes, I just wanted to latch on to what Andrew was saying about Italy. Um, I spent the last two months in Italy living at home with my parents, and I'm 28. <laughs> Despite this, that is the most common experience of my friends, being at home, unemployed, and living with your parents. I mean, in the country, youth unemployment is about 35%. And what does the technocratic Monti government do in this situation? It uh, raises the retirement age of some years. My mother is 59. She has been working since she was 19, and she has to work now for another four, five, nobody knows how long, actually years, because of these reforms. Will you believe that this is a good way to tackle youth unemployment? Of course it's not. Um, the point, anyway, is in this situation, a lot of people look really disaffected from, policy, from politics. As Andrew was saying, there is a sense of alienation. And there, is a, there was a survey which was saying something quite striking. About one third of young people in Italy say that they distrust democracy. But in this, in this situation, that's not surprising. And the real issue is actually, it's not that they don't care. It's not that they, don't, they do want an, an authoritarian government, not at all. The point is that they perceive that politics is really detached from their lives. When it comes to have social movements, which are really kind of dealing with issues, with topics which are close to people's life, like the battle against the high-speed uh, railway in northern Italy, you can see really movements blossoming up throughout the country, which means there is a potential to do politics, there is a potential to um, fight, to change the system. The real point is that people who are politically active have to be within the movements, look at what the real issues are that people feel, and fight for change not just uh, act within political institutions which are at the moment really distant from the people's life and people's interests. Um, thank you, I thought that was really interesting and um, thank you Andrew and Danielle, thank you for coming all the way over from France. Um, and we're looking forward to the election results in April as well. Um, I just thought I'd pick up on what you said about um, the offensive fight and the sort of continued uh, fight for democracy and, and Richard had touched upon this um, and it is just there's this kind of myth um, that our rights were given to us that one day you know the government kind of woke up and thought oh I'm feeling beneficial today I'm going to give you give you the NHS or give you like women the right to vote and it's it's ridiculous really because every single right that we have um, was won the right for men to vote the right for women to vote uh, the, the, the fact that we have an NHS and uh, the second you stop fighting for these things. You see the kind of thing that's happening now, like the rolling back of the, of the NHS, the, uh, the attacks on our universities, um, and the attacks on democracy. So I just think it's really important to emphasize that we keep, you know, that it's always going to be a, an offensive fight. We can never settle down and think, oh, this can be, you know, a defensive fight, or, you know, or we can just, like, take, take the day off. Um, and then a, a point that Andrew made about um, how we actually go about this, um, and, I mean, you mentioned that the, the trade unions are the best way um, of, of advancing this struggle. And, and I agree with that, like, to an extent. And I think um, Unite, in particular, is leading the way in terms of um, including people who are not employed. And I think that it's uh, inclusion of unemployed people and inclusion of um, students is a good thing. But I also think that there's a lot more to democracy. And for, for me, having you know, worked with you in the Stop the War Coalition for 10 years, um, that, the, you know, when I've been uh, in Hyde Park or outside um, Parliament, that's when I felt 
the most in my whole life that I was expressing my democratic rights. Mm. So I think it's really important, you know, that even if you're not in a trade union, you know, you're involved with the coalition resistance and counterfire and the Stop the War coalition and, and the student movement and all the progressive um, movements that are going on at the moment. And in that way, we can actually, you know, get more democracy because that's what we need, not less democracy. Thanks. Thanks very much for the contributions. I'm afraid we've run out of time for discussion. I'm going to uh, just bring back the speakers for a brief sum up from each of them. Before I do, I'm going to make some announcements. Um, if you missed the session on uh, Neil Faulkner, Brief History of the World, well, you did because you were here, so you definitely missed it. <laughs> um, there will be a repeat of the session at 4.40. Uh, it will be at St. Hilda's, which you've probably heard the directions to, but it's right out of the building, right again onto uh, Club Row, is it? And, uh, and then walk for a minute, and it's on your right. So three rights. Um, don't make a right. <laughs> uh, uh, visit the mezzanine upstairs if you haven't been already. There's stalls. There's courses to get signed up to. Uh, there's books up there as well. And uh, the third thing is dinner will be served at 7.30, venues 1 and 2. Uh, there will be entertainment there. I think there's some buskers and some music and so on. So um, I'm going to bring Daniel back for five minutes and then Andrew as well. Okay, I don't know if I can sum up anything, but just to add a few things um, about the, the idea of democracy from below uh, versus democracy from the top. Uh, just to say a few things. Uh, what is quite uh, contradictory uh, nowadays is we got at the same time what we describe the attacks and the, the, the sense of alienation from politics, and at the same time, great incredible movement like Occupy Wall Street and the, the Indianados in, in, uh, in, in Spain and uh, all the, the, the Europe, this period of resistance has been constant for the past uh, decades. But at the same time, there's a kind of a gap between those movements, those, this spirit of resistance and people fighting in social movements and the existing as this institution as if the state, the power, the, the question of power, who holds the power, whether in the factory, whether in the workplace, and at the top of the so society, is disconnected from the social movement. And we can, there can be mass movement and, 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 and fight and, uh, and resistance, but at the same time, it's like the state is left and it, it uh, also fuels this, this sen sense of alienation because the state is left to keep doing the things that they, they are doing. And uh, I think that, that our task is not only nowadays just to be part of the movement and build the movement, but also build the consciousness that we need, we can't avoid the power, we can't avoid this, the state power and the economic power and to confront them directly. Um, and there needs to be this understanding uh, that the system and the institution needs to be uh, confronted and, uh, and changed and, uh, and um, because no matter, as, as we said, no matter how far we go in the movement and, and every right we, we, we win, it will always be under attack as long as the system is still this top-down system. Just to, to finish, just to, uh, because with this uh, recall from history, because tomorrow is the anniversary of uh, La Commune. In, uh, in, in, in the French history, it's a great, great moment of working class struggle. It's from this time that uh, Marx just developed uh, a new, new, uh, new idea about what is communism because of what happened in La Commune. And it started at, like an anti-war movement because France was at war against Germany and people in Paris uh, didn't want uh, the... Uh, the weapons to be moved to go and, and, and do the war, and they began to just do barricades for uh, against uh, against those uh, war movements, and it ended up like people just controlling the whole city, and the government was away in Versailles, and they just ran what was basically the first working class, you know, commune and and the first working class uh, state, uh, and it was a great moment, and it still inspires. Um, uh, movement nowadays, but the one thing they forgot is that the power that was away uh, was still aware of them and, and was ready and they were uh, uh, repressed and, and it's, uh, 
it has been um, a, a terrible blow for the working class movement in France for decades after that because they, they uh, forgot that the power didn't forgot them. So we got, at the same time, uh, what um, history reminds us is that what progress can be made in time of movement, in time of, of, uh, of, uh, of social movements, but also that there needs to be an understanding of how the way of um, the way the system works and the way that uh, we need to get organized to face the state and uh, to uh, to confront it and to basically smash it if we want to build another society and if we want to have through democracy uh, well thanks obviously there's a high degree of agreement i think in the uh, discussion. Just one point I wanted to just perhaps clarify what I said earlier in relation to what Tansy said. If I said that the trade union movement is the main uh, weapon for democracy, I, I meant to say the labour movement, which I think is a slightly broader and more politically defined concept. But I certainly do, and I'm, I'm sure well, Tansy and everyone agrees with this, if we say democracy is a class concept, then the class that fights for democracy has to be identified, and of course that is rooted uh, above all uh, in the uh, trade union and the labor movement, while it does have to, as we did do in Stop the War, uh, unite uh, vast numbers of people around it if we are to be successful from uh, different classes and different parts of, uh, of society. Um, because there's a high degree of unity in the discussion, I'll take this opportunity not to reply to any other points, but to start to talk a little bit about what, if we are defending democracy, what it actually means in terms of our demands. Because John and Richard, I think, who said, really, in the end, we are fighting for socialism, are absolutely right. But as in Stop the War, I think the whole leadership of Stop the War would have agreed with the proposition that to stop war, ultimately, you need to defeat and end imperialism. However, we built a movement that included people that don't necessarily share that point of view or have a different angle or a different, uh, uh, a different take on it. And I think today there are millions of people at the moment right now who are very worried about democracy and its future but aren't necessarily yet uh, one to the idea that uh, full socialism uh, is uh, what is needed, at least in the uh, immediate future. So I can think of five demands that we could make that address the sort of democratic issues that have come up in real life in the last 10 years. I mean, the first and simplest, and I am back to trade unions here, uh, is to repeal uh, the laws that stop trade unions defending their own members and working people at work. Britain is more encumbered with those laws than any other, but Tories want to take them even further. I mean, luckily, we're sometimes blessed in our enemies, and the Tory MP leading the charge was also the one uh, paying the bill at the Nazi-themed stag party in the south of France um, uh, for his, um, uh, his best friend. So he's a bit disgraced, but we have to be aware that defending and extending trade union class rights uh, are at the core uh, of our democratic case. Secondly, why shouldn't we introduce the recall of MPs? Why should the people of Falkirk have to put up with another four years of Eric Joyce MP? Uh, and he's a Labour MP, but, uh, uh, and there's many uh, just as bad on the Tory uh, side. I think many people coming out of the expenses scandal will see, yes, we ought to be able to get to a threshold and force a by-election to change our MP. The control of the police. Well, we saw in the riots last year how disastrous policing is and the consequences of that uh, in our society. Can't, can't we argue, develop plans for policing to be much more devolved into and returned to the communities, to have self-policing communities with the professional police force only doing specialist and sort of obviously murder inquiries and things like that? The control of the media. Uh, that, that's another part of the scandal that everyone can see now, that monopoly control of the media by a few very rich people. And when we already somewhat regulate broadcasting, but regulating the press, making sure there's a plurality of press ownership, giving control of newspapers to proper democratic organisations across the range of, uh, of society. Uh, and finally... The question about what has, what most, who most threatens democracy? Who takes us into these criminal wars? Whose interests drive the attacks on democracy? Now, for those of you who've been sitting on the edge of their seats wondering what's the worst thing about the 1930s, I only got as far as the second worst, I think. The worst thing was, of course, it led to war. And the forces that drive British foreign policy, uh, it, it, uh, the big oil, the arms industry, and the big banks, if they were taken under public ownership and public control, that wouldn't mean we're in a socialist society yet, but it would mean that these private pressures that profit from war, that profit from the grabbing of resources, that profit from selling arms, that profit from speculation, they 
would not have the obscene degree of political influence that they've been shown to have uh, in the uh, recent past, taking this country uh, into wars and shaping the whole agenda. If you just took a few of them into public ownership, probably that would mean the state sector of the economy would be small by comparison to where it was in the 1960s and the 1970s. But those five demands, I believe, are all democratic demands. They don't amount to socialism, but they all have enormous uh, support. And if, as Richard uh, said, uh, well, the bastards wouldn't quite be booted out yet, but they would be pretty effing miserable. <laughs>